We're about to go live. Hey guys and girls, <clears throat> thanks a lot for tuning in to this week's Facebook Live. I have a new guest for everyone here. It does this thing, Charlie. It goes, <laughs> says it's going live, but then it does a Cuts pause. Out. So, okay. uh, we'll see. Girls, welcome this week's Facebook Live. Uh, Nathan here from the Be Invested headquarters, and I have a special guest today. Hey guys, Charlie. Charlie. <laughs> you've seen Charlie's colleagues. You've seen Wayne, Pat, John. Gemma, Jeremy. Mm. Today, now we've got Charlie on board. So, um, if you talk with Charlie on a daily basis, now you've got a face to who you've been talking to and working with, and and whatnot. Um, and I've got lots of questions. We're just chatting about some of your clients and what they've been up to and um, some of their portfolios. And I was asking you, like, who's your top three clients of recent time? And uh, you told me some, and those are really, really interesting stories there. So we'll get into that a little bit later, just on what other people are doing currently in the market. But um, before we get into that, um, as always, Charlie, I get here, and I think you watch this every Tuesday from home. Of course. But uh, we've got some articles, some news articles, some fun stuff to talk about. And Charlie was saying just a couple of minutes ago, I love how you just shove it in the screen <laughs> and share with people stuff. So uh, this one here is a, a press release, actually. It's not actually even a news article. It's a press release from the White House's own website. So this was sent to me from one of my investors uh, yesterday. And uh, it says here, fact sheet, the Department of Energy releases new notice of sale of gasoline prices continue to fall. So a lot of people out there might be thinking, oh, well, you know, we're going to meant to be having hyperinflation, but now we're seeing deflation, right? And it's interesting to take note of some of the dodgy things that the government do. And, you know, everyone thinks the government's there to save them, but it's actually just complete manipulation and fraud. But this article was out on the 26th of July, 2022. And uh, let's read into it and see what it has to say. Treasury Department estimates that strategic petroleum reserve releases by President uh, Sleepy Joe and international partners reduced the price of gasoline by up to 40 cents per gallon. Congratulations to You're Joe rich. Biden. Yeah, he's like, yeah, well, to Joe Biden, he's done something here, right? Today, the Biden administration announced that it's releasing uh, the next notice of sale to supply additional barrels of crude oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. So it's called an SPR, right? And always, just to share with everyone where it says SPR here, um, it says the Strategic Petroleum Reserves here. Right? And if you notice, that's in capital letters. So it's always interesting to see what these capital letter things mean because it's referring to something that's uh, an item, right? It's an SPR. Um, so it's selling the US um, reserve supplies of, of oil at a discounted price. So what it's doing is it's artificially dropping um, the value of the oil um, to try and manipulate the market down. Um, building on more than 125 billion barrels of oil that have already been sold, a new analysis from the Department of Treasury estimates that these releases, along with coordinated releases from international partners, have reduced gasoline prices by up to about 40 cents per gallon compared to what they would have been absent these drawdowns. The administration is also announcing steps to repurchase oil from the SPR in future years, likely after 23, to help stabilize the market and encourage near-term supply. These actions will be will enable the administration to continue the work on shoring up supply and bringing prices down. So what do I take from that, right? What do I take from that? I take from that that if you or I did that, Charlie, we would probably be done for insider trading, for fraud, or for many other different things. But when it's the government doing these sort of criminal acts of manipulating markets and being able to control markets using paper contracts and, you know, artificially manipulating yeah. things up or down, it's perfectly fine. And there so should free. be a, yeah, we give them a, a, a thumbs up and a, a gold medal for that. So it's just very, very interesting and very concerning to see that they have the ability to do so. So um, I actually filled up my trusty Mitsubishi Mirage that I'm still driving. <laughs> I should be getting rid of the Mitsubishi Mirage this week. I've got one of my two cars arriving <laughs> this week. So this car can be going back to the uh, the pool of driving for staff. But um, 
yeah, uh, I did fill that up the other day, and I was thinking to myself, shit, the petrol price has come down, right? But when looking at it, there's artificially controlled contracts, and it, it then creates, like every lever that is pulled, it's like there's always a lever that's getting pulled from the system, whether it's bonds being manipulated. And I don't actually have the bond yields today to share with everyone, but I encourage everyone to go and look at the bond prices for a US Treasury, right? The US bond rates for a 10-year Treasury um, is about 2.95. I looked at it yesterday. Um, I think I actually posted it in the in Birch feed the other day. I'm going to pull it up and go into Birch feed while we're chatting. If you guys aren't on Birch feed yet, you should be on there. And uh, there's no need to be a tight ass because it doesn't cost anyone to join. It's free. So you can join up at birchfeed.com, just birchfeed.com. But yes, here we go. This was from 48 hours ago, sort of timing. Uh, the 10-year US Treasury bond is 2.976. The five-year bond is 3.09. Oh, the five-year, sorry, 3.09. The three-year is 3.26. And the two-year is 3.23. That is very, very crucial knowledge, right? And Charlie, we are talking about this earlier on today because you quite often have, you know, investors that you speak to, they, you know, they still watch TV mm. and they get scared. <laughs> You're like, mm, yeah, it's a very <laughs> common thing that happens. People get brainwashed by what's happening out there in the media, right? And you, you have as a thought like of, of people that come to you, some people question like how high will interest rates go? Mm. You know, the TV's telling me they're going to go to 10%, whatever. Bond yields are very closely correlated to the futures of where yeah. the interest rates will be. So a 10 year bond, um, basically if you've got, let's say you've got a billion dollars or a trillion dollars to go and invest, like a money printing com com uh, corporation, um, and you were to invest your money into a bond, if you were to invest it for a year, you would expect to get more or less than locking your money away for 10 years, yeah. right? So if you're locking your money away for 10 years, you'd want to get a better return. Of course. Well. What we're seeing here is that if you lock it away for 10 years, you're going to get 2.9. Or if you lock it away for two years, you're going to get 3.2. Might as well lock it for two years. Only for two years. But then what happens if you only if everyone's locking their money for two years in two-year bonds or three-year bonds or five-year bonds? It means no one's taking out the 10-year bonds. And then that causes a, a liquidity squeeze in the market. And what we're seeing here, we're seeing that the 10-year bond is cheaper than or less return than a two-year or three-year or whatever. Uh, is actually, it's a thing called an inversion of the yield curve. Mm -hmm. So it should be sort of going up the more you invest, the longer you invest, the more you get, but there's a crack. So when the yield curve last 100 years, it's only been once or twice that it hasn't ended in a recession. And this is a red light that we have seen now twice in a period of three months since I've started playing with interest rates out there, that there's been an inversion to the bond yield. So if we look at, this is straight from the White House, you can't make it up, you can go and read it on the website. It's not you know, anything that's been made up, but it has been very hidden because they haven't talked about this all over the yeah. news, right? You don't hear about this stuff on the news. But if that's what they're playing with over there, as they pull that lever to drop the oil prices, which has a correlation allegedly to the price of the money that we use, because we've got a petrol, petrodollar, it's an oil-based currency, um, we're now starting to see inversions happening to the bond yield, which means that that will drag the interest rates down. And it'll cause one of two things. It'll cause a lack, a lack of liquidity in the system, which will eventually lead to a recession, which will then lead to the need for more liquidity to be put in the system. For them to put more money in the system, they're going to have to lower rates and print a lot more money and you know basically have a repeat of what we've just seen. So... Uh, interesting note to be had there, and we've just seen in China last week, they dropped the interest rates for the first time. And uh, I've got three more articles here to read. One of them is very interesting. It's about interest rates falling here in Australia. So without um, you know, waiting any further, let's go to the next article, which is from, I actually had one of my clients send me three of these articles today, which got sent to me yesterday, but we will have a... Look at this. So this article here is from Channel 9 News. Relief is coming for shoppers as fruit and veggie prices tumble. <laughs> <laughs> 
So we had Pat on two weeks ago and he had a bag of groceries and he said it cost him 50 bucks for a little bag of fruit yeah. and vegetables, right? And um, yeah, shopping at the wrong places, right? Let's read the article. There's finally some relief for shoppers as sky-high prices for fruit and vegetables start settling back down to earth. Shortages of products such as iceberg lettuce cause... <laughs> it's very funny, right? <sighs> There is some relief for Australian shoppers as sky-high prices of fruit and vegetables start settling back down to earth. Shortages of products such as iceberg lettuce, which were caused via heavy flooding and mm. supply chain disruptions, saw prices soar in recent months. Okay, well, we saw some flooding that caused iceberg lettuces go up, but what about... The cost of the cars, what about the cost of your electricity bill? Everything else. Literally right? everything else. So what happened with those occasions? They right? got flooded too. <laughs> they got flooded too, right? Flooded with fake flooded with fake currency and manipulation yeah. of fraud to the system, right? But it got flooded. That's the reason why. Everyone hold calm. It was a third party, it was the heavens above that, you know, flooded all over it and you know, here we go. Um, saw prices soar in recent months to a point where fast food joints such as KFC and Subway were substituting cabbage for their products. And I used to like cabbage until I ate a Zinger burger. I'm like, that's disgusting. I went to Hungry Jack's the other day. Everywhere. And there was no, there wasn't even like cabbage. You know, they substituting <laughs> it with cabbage. There was just nothing. It was just bread, meat, bread. And it wasn't even real meat. Yeah, it's all fake. So I'm just it eating... tastes like plastic when you have it. It's crazy. Won't be going there again. Oh. Well, it's for your health. It's best that we don't go there. <laughs> Fred Harrison from Richie's IGA in Melbourne said, things were looking up. <laughs> I think the weather has got a lot to do with it. <laughs> Good on you, right? Good on you. From Richie's at IGA. Maybe we can look at some other things. We have seen a moder moderation, from mod right. moderation from the rain and the crops are in and growing and be bring on the warm weather because that's going to continue to help. He said red and green capsicums were down from a couple of dollars a kilogram, as were zucchinis. <laughs> lettuce prices are coming back. We remember the story about the iceberg lettuce at twelve dollars. It's getting back to seven dollars now. <laughs> a fucking lettuce for seven bucks. <laughs> a lettuce for seven bucks, and broccoli is down a couple of dollars a kilo too. Harrison said today. <laughs> He admitted that products would remain stubbornly high priced, including tomatoes and green beans. <laughs> the later of which has reached about 30 to $40 a kilo. <laughs> oh yeah. Green beans, guys. Fuck. <laughs> that will improve as the weather maintains and the crops come through, he said. He's, he sounds like an expert. He's he running a, a supermarket. Yeah, he's yeah. like an expert. wonder where he's got the information from, from the news yeah. or from the reporter. I remember doing articles for the ABC, the Australian Brainwashing Corporation, right? And I was in the car and they were driving me around and they wanted me to say that because of negative gearing, I was successful. And it was sort of like a a, a push for a labour ad, right? Mm. Basically, it was a labour ad trying to push for me to say it. I wouldn't say it. And they didn't air the story because they drove me for five hours really? trying to put the words in my mouth. Like they go, wouldn't it be more like you'd have to admit, though, Nathan, that negative gearings had a great thing. And after I didn't answer what they did, they started taking personal attacks at me, trying to get me jaded on camera. And it didn't work. But like, it's just who puts these words in their mouth? Um, uh, where are we at now? Uh, who would have thought green beans at 40 bucks a kilo? <laughs> a <lot>. Fucking peas. <laughs> okay. All the kids out there will be happy. They're getting fed poisonous chips from Maccas that never have a pit in it. They're yeah. just always like really clean chips that they have. And the kids don't have to eat their greens anymore because they can't afford it. <laughs> they can't crazy. afford it. That will improve as the weather maintains the crops come through. Harrison said shoppers had a reason to feel a little optimism after a horror year at the checkout. Well, in Zimbabwe, uh, in Venezuela, it's actually, there's a news article. I don't have the article, but go check it out. In Venezuela, they actually broke into the zoos and ate animals because they had no food, right? But apparently it's been a horror year because the iceberg lettuce cost $12 <laughs> and it's all good now because it's come down from $12 to $7. Um, I remember buying lettuces for $1, $2, $3. Yeah, not even per kilo, just, you just grab the lettuce. Buy the lettuce, yeah. So it's interesting, right? 
And I have another one here, um, which is basically the same sort of article uh, from news.com. It says here, it's a miracle. <laughs> it's a miracle. Shoppers erupt over grocery items price drop. Sydney shoppers are rejoicing after spotting the price of one grocery item nosedive, saying good things come to those who wait. <laughs> shoppers are celebrating a long-awaited turn in luck as the price of an iceberg lettuce drops in the supermarkets across Sydney. The cost of the everyday item reportedly jumped as high as 12 bucks in the last 12 months, uh, last six months, as flooding rains destroyed the crops. Over the weekend, mum, markers of the Members of the Markdown Addicts Facebook page shared images of price relief, calling it a miracle. <laughs> One shopper showed a Coles display item with a price marked at $2.50 each for a head of lettuce um, and another marginally higher at $2.90. 90. Let us celebrate this miracle. Sounds uh, like a dad joke. Let, <laughs> let us celebrate this miracle, they said. Good thing comes to those who wait, another said. Like Coles, it seems Audi, Woolworths and IGA have followed suit. Last week, the prices were $8 minimum, so it's new to me, and personally, I wouldn't buy one at that price, one user wrote. It's a miracle that this is so low. Anyway, it's it's hilarious. But my question is, guys, is we have seen interest rate, we've seen the petrol price come down, we've seen all these things come down. So we've been in a high inflationary period, right? Inflation just keeps hitting, everything goes up in value constantly higher and higher and yeah. higher. Higher things means that like your your food at the local cafe is probably twenty dollars for a little burger now. Um, a smoothie is like, um, but you get a smoothie and it's probably Ten like bucks. twelve bucks, yeah, yeah something like that, right? <laughs> so the prices of the fruit and vegetables drop now. That's great for everybody, but what happens to the cafe workers that want thirty dollars an hour instead of twenty dollars an hour? that the cafe owner now has to pay her a higher wage. wage they file. can't pay the wage barrels up. So people can go, okay, we've got some money, we can save with what we're buying, but now we're gonna start seeing businesses go broke, right? And you need to sort of look at the levers that are being played here because ultimately it's sending us into a massive recession, massive recession. And only a few things can play with, right? They can play with the rates, they can play with, you know, liquidity in the system they can play with the cost of petrol but ultimately once they've stopped manipulating which is what we've seen the last two years we've seen manipulated market the only reason why everyone's house is worth what it's worth is because of the fraud of printing so much currency and the the prices being able to sustain such high pricing what happens next what happens next is a question and that takes me to article number four for today which is an exciting one, right? Last week, I pulled out an article to show that China had reduced the interest rates at the central mm. bank the, um, of China. And today, or this week, we see Suncorp Bank changes home lending fixed interest rates, right? Wow. You must think, well, this is from the 19th of August, so it's since like a few days ago. Why would a bank drop their interest rates for? Like, do they want to just do the right thing and be a good Samaritan? Or are they taking a bet? A bet, and just think about this, right? The banks are more heavily connected than you or I. They've got more money than all of us. And they pretty much run all the media outlets around the world. Mm. So when we look at um, the article, it says another another Australian bank has announced a big change in interest rates following Westpac's move on Thursday. Another lifeline has been extended to borrowers after another lifeline. Right? I love this fucking clickbait stuff that they do. Another lifeline has been extended to borrowers after Suncorp Bank announced it's dropping home lending in fixed interest rates. Suncorp cut owner-occupier rates by up to 0.76 percentage points, with its changes effective as of Friday. The decrease means that base rates have fallen across owner-occupied and investment home loans for two, three, and five-year fixed terms. Why didn't they drop the loan rate on a 12-month interest rate? Why didn't they do it? I'm just curious, right? It's just mm. a question, right? It's just a rhetorical question, really. Mm. But why did they only do it on two, three, and five-year fixed terms? Because they know in the longer term, they want people to rush in and fix their interest rates yeah. because they're going to drop them, right, somewhere in the next 12 months. Yeah. 
and that they're going to benefit from this by selling the rate at five years at that. And all the people that are, you know, scaredy cats and shit, they're going to go out and fix the interest rates, go, oh, this is the best thing I've ever heard. Suncorp dropped the interest rates. And they're going to be stuck. They're going to be, fuck, I can't sell my house because it's stuck. When you fix an interest rate, you're locked. So if you sell it, you can't get out. Um, you, have, you, you have to pay a break fee. Um, if you, um, yeah, there's many negatives about it. So I'm not saying to fix or not to fix, but I think that when you're seeing that the banks, you're taking a bet against the bank on fixing them, and the banks are obviously reducing the longer term because they can see that the tail end of the bond market is starting to fall apart, which will flow over into the interest rate market. So interesting times that we see out there. We've got a recession that's occurring, but they're not calling it a recession. They're just saying, oh, well, everything's great and all that sort of stuff. And inflation needs to be curved. But as they're trying to fix inflation, the whole system is going to implode. Mm. So are they going to take inflation? Or they're going to take deflation. Deflation's a mad recession. Inflation is a really bad thing for everyone, <laughs> right? Uh, but if you own shit, I'd rather have a deflation. I'd rather have a recession because there's lots of opportunities. Yes, my shit goes down lower, but the opportunity to pick up more stuff yeah. on sale. But you know, people fear. You know, oh, I'm going to wait for the property crash, right? But they've just changed interest rates over four months and pushed them all the way up. What about when they start bringing them down just at the same speed? And the writing's on the wall that they're going to have to to fix these markets. So just an interesting uh, interesting time out there. I've got so many people message me and stuff. Um, <laughs> lots of people message me. Anyway, enough of my news. Um, I think we've got a lot of people online now. Uh, let's go and have a look at some of the comments and then we'll get over to Charlie with lots of questions. So we've got here, Charlie's the best dressed in the office. Yeah. Oh. He even has shoes. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, you just need shoes. <laughs> you need shoes, right? Uh, no, everyone else has shoes. It's just me without the shoes. Manufactured fuel price drop ahead of November midterm, correct? Uh, evening, Birchie. <laughs> uh, rat's tail flash. Look, I've had, it, um, I've had one of my staff plight it really nicely for me, which is, uh, which is nice. Every time you come in. Yeah, it's, it's great. It's great. I like getting my plats, flat, rat's tail plaited. Gemma's, Charlie, Charlie, Charlie. Yeah. Peter, there's <laughs> Peter there. <laughs> Matt says, here, grow your own. I don't know if you mean rat's tail or food. I'm assuming you're saying food. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get the letters? Well, it's actually interesting, right? Like, there's lots of... I don't, I don't know why people don't do this, right? Like... Wait for the next cabbage boom. No, no. <laughs> like... It's so easy to grow corn, right? Yeah. If you want to grow corn, you just get a corn kernel, right? They're saying it's hard to get sweet corn, right? That shit grows better <laughs> than your fucking grass, right? <laughs> you could literally rip all the corn off the cob. You don't cut it. You need the little yeah. little pip on the bottom, and you just plant it in the ground. You literally just cut, you rip it off, throw it in the ground, and it'll grow corn trees. Mm. You can crack off your own corn, but people aren't being told to do this. So... Um, little tip of the day, go onto YouTube and look at your favourite fruit and vegetables to grow and work out how to germinate them mm. and you can start growing around your backyard. You don't have to mow the lawn. Um, what else have we got here? Uh, Birchies, what's your thought on the 30-day interbank rate at 3.8? Do you think the RBA rates will go there? I don't believe so. I think that we might see another quarter to a half percent next month, but we're really, really stretching it to the later limits right we're already starting to see like surprisingly that lettuce has fallen surprisingly that these things have fallen is a reflection we're going to start seeing small businesses start falling apart we've seen more um what is it bank liquidations administrations or liquidations and um, all that wind ups of business bankruptcy of business in the last four months and it's not just due to, um, you know, the interest rates or in, inflation. Like, there's many different factors that, you know, there's a, we're in a recession and people aren't seeing it. It's just like, okay, let's throw a, bat, a match at all that toxic waste over there. So the more, um, the more that we go into a recession or the more that we have deflation, the more businesses are going to blow up. So we either have people hurting because they can't afford things or we see the businesses blow up. We see people blow up from a recession. People won't have a job in the future. Wages will fall. Um, and then people won't be able to afford to pay for their big mortgages. And it's just a, a cycle. Um, so they can 
either let the house prices fall, which is what everyone hopes for, but the people that control this or the entities, should we call it, that mm. control this, uh, they know that the asset, their asset, the bank's asset, the bank's value is only based on the assets that it holds. So they need to protect the assets of the bank, otherwise the bank will implode. So, you know, this manipulation and fraud will just continue to go through market to market. So, um, Seven uh, Eleven's been putting the coffee up one dollars to two dollars. That's a fifty. That's a hundred percent increase. Hundred, yeah. Um, Matt just said, "Isn't SunCorp the bank that wants to microchip us all?" Yes, it's a good point there, Matt. Um, there's articles out there. And you can go to the SunCorp Bank's website about getting microchipped, and they actually think it's important for everybody to get microchipped. It's on their website, right? Why would you want to get microchipped for? It sounds to me a lot like the mark of the beast, right? Mm. But we're not going to religion. We're not, you know, going down there. But um, here we go. Gemma said, sausage sizzle is now $3.50 at Bunnings. Coming from a foreigner, Aussie's got the sausage sizzle right. Leave it alone. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> um, Tim says, when do you think the rates will drop again? I think that we'll start seeing things saying we are officially in a recession uh, probably around October, November this year. Um, and they the rates may not drop until February next year, March, April, May. But I think in the first half, by end of financial year, we will, yeah, we'll see the rates drop. <laughs> uh, Harpreet says, uh, come on, Nathan, everything is under control as per Philip Lowe. <laughs> I still remember the same criminals said that interest rates would not be rising until 2024. So you can believe what these people are saying or you can see what they're doing. Um, you can look at going back in 2019, in February 2019, he said the next interest rate move would be up and within five months, the interest rates dropped for the first time. So be very, very um, careful with uh, what you listen to. Um, uh, what have we got here? Love your, these videos. Thanks, your own, Adam. Grow your own grass, someone said. Always grow, grow your own grass. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but uh, yeah, I don't know if they're saying grow grass. I haven't had that for a very, very long time. Um, <laughs> know what we're talking about. But um, on that note, tonight we've got special guest Charlie. Charlie, hey, hey. lots of fans out there. Lots of people. That, fans, yeah. You've got lots of fans out there. People what love talking to you. What can I say? Well, you're telling me beforehand some of your investor stories of recent times, right? So yeah, yeah. I asked you to come tonight with three um, cool stories in the last month that you've seen. Mm. And maybe if you could share with the community, maybe if we work through one by one, obviously we can't say names, we yeah. can't go too far into specifics and stuff like that. But you know, I asked you just off the top of your head three people and yeah. You told me beforehand who you're thinking and I thought they were cool people. So yeah. See my first thing was it was like blurt their name out. Yeah, don't blurt their yeah, name I out. Obviously won't. But um I had this one guy come to me. Yeah. He lost his job because he wouldn't get the jab. Okay. Sold his house, moved in with his parents, had nine K sitting yeah. in his account. Since he had no income, he couldn't service for like you know, he couldn't service for a dollar. Yeah. So what he had to do was obviously buy properties cash. To then you know get that cash flow to use as an income to then justify a, a normal finance loan from the bank yeah so in the span of two months he got four properties cash and now he's got two finance yeah and that's all in the span of like i said like 60 days and 60 days those, six properties. from from those four cash he's on like 55 grand passive who needs a job <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah a lot of people have changed their lifestyle because they didn't want to take the uh the jabberoonie yeah. and um you know that's a that's a cool story you know like we've seen people come to us for all different reasons not just you know because of that when i first started the business i didn't think we'd be dealing with such things as what we deal with today in in business but that's a, a cool story you, you said that you have another investor that started with a you know just a, an average sort of family home owner mm. in sydney um that got to seven in how long yeah yeah so no names yeah no <laughs> Um, so you know, he did seven properties. Well, they they did seven properties in like seventy days. I think it was because they've they came on board less than three months ago. Seven properties, seventy, 70 days. days. That's there a challenge. Go. Are they on like a million without going into any no, income? No. Are they on a million dollar income? Is no, anything crazy? Just normal families yeah, without no. going. Yeah, you know, hey, they're, they're, they're 
Just staying yeah. older, elderly couple, but they're not. Yeah. Yeah. I've got kids, normal. Probably like you in a decade yeah. or so. <laughs> <laughs> kids. But no, so, yeah, they're great. They're, yeah. yeah. Thanks for saying I'm old, Charlie. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, wow, that's crazy that you say that I'm old. Come on, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mate. We've got to look at the deflated balloons over here. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the birthday balloons yeah. are still over here. So, yeah. Cool. And um, do you have any others that there was a third person? There was the. Um, without saying names? Yeah. Or... What was <laughs> um, yeah, so there was this one guy who was. He was who was probably one of my younger clients, uh, early early twenties. Early twenties, okay. Like yeah, under like twenty three, twenty four. So younger clients, not old farts. Like yeah, not like 30, you. Not 30, like 30, you. 37, 40, no. 45. Right. <laughs> and um, he did. He's done four in like a bit over a month. Four and, in a month. Yeah, and okay. that's just from he already had one investment property, so he wasn't from scratch. But that one we were able to pull equity and obviously just, yeah. justifying his um, serviceability with his income. Yeah. And see what we can do and present it in the right properties in the right order, getting to that four yeah. in a pretty very very short time. Hey, that's like we've had everyone else on here. Like Wayne when he was on, he said he had all the you know, everyone he goes, oh, I had this single lady and then he said he had another single lady, right? And yeah, I don't, like, have, I, 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 I don't have many female clients. You, you've got like these clients that are like they've done a lot of shit in a very short period of time. Like we're talking yeah. like seventy days, seven properties. Um, Steer them in the right direction. Six properties in sixty days, and four properties in like two months, three months. It's like that's really cool. Like, I'm sure that if your investors that you just mentioned went to a barbecue on the weekend and said, "Hey, mm. I just went into this," and say, "You're a liar," mm. or they'd probably say, "Like, aren't you scared about interest rates? Oh, I heard property prices are going to fall. Whatever the case, right? Like yeah. the belief system out there." But in reality, I know. Like, they're things that I've heard for the last decade, right? They're things I've heard for the last two decades, showing my age now to you, right? <laughs> um, they're things that I've heard for the last two decades about, um, yeah, the, 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 the you know, whether it be the positive or the negative of it. And it, one thing I have noticed over all these very long years that I've been doing this, because I'm very old, Charlie. <laughs> I'm not going to live that cut down. Cut me deep, didn't I? Yeah, cut me deep, right? <laughs> cut me deep. But, um, uh, it gets harder as the years go by for people to build, you know, those portfolios in that such short time frame, right? Yeah. So, like, people could have done it much quicker going back 10 years ago. But, you know, a lot of people think it's still impossible to go and buy seven properties in five years. And you're yeah. talking about someone that's not... I know this person's position, and it's not like they've got some special luck that's you know they've got well, a they've got a sugar daddy or they something really had, or they've got they had their primary place they primary place any, other, any other property just their primary place so no properties just principal place average family not like on million dollar incomes mm. not anything crazy um seven properties in 70 days that's mad yeah yeah cool talking about the properties what would be like the market is changing. People say, "Oh, the property market is going to fall, and the ass is going to fall out, and all that." Um, you know, they'll be sitting here going, oh, "I wish I could buy a property," and probably still can't afford a property <laughs> today or in five years. But what are some of the deals that you're seeing at the moment, like come through for your investors? So like you just said all these properties, like these are like we're talking about just some random properties before, and I can't even remember which ones they were. We do lots of properties on a daily basis, mm -hmm. but what are some of the sorts of numbers that people can find in the current market and yeah it obviously depends where you're looking obviously we can't Without get too deep into that we can't but, say where they are yeah, obviously um but we had these ones come up say like probably a month ago there was yeah. duplex um duplex for 125k so you got both sides 62 grand per side yeah. um each side renting for 240 so you know, a 480 combined income of a 125k purchase. Once well, again, if you went to the barbecue on the weekend and yeah. said, and that's this is my 20% yield. <laughs> that's actually in a capital city. That's in a capital yeah. city. That's yeah. like in the capital city in this country. Yeah. yeah. And so that one, yeah, I, one guy, I, one guy buy one cash, one guy do one finance. It's a, and yeah, that one, yeah. without getting too into the numbers, you just, just without doing the calculations, you just think about, you know, 
480 a week rent off a 125 purchase. Well, I know people that can't service, right? I know people will be watching this going, shit, I can't buy a, a property. The bank won't give me a loan. But if you had 100 grand, do you buy this thing? Yeah. yeah well, this is no financial advice to everyone. So if the government's watching, yeah, we're not giving up advice, <laughs> right? Um, but we're here to you know just share with what people are doing like that's how people design these portfolios it's not by luck it's not just by a fucking big big large chunk of cash not by it's not by powerball (laughs) the funny thing is actually we're going to get to talking about this more in what we do and in our marketing charlie is that i know single-handedly that this business has created more millionaires in australia than lotto has in the last decade yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we're going to talk about that more, like just with our yeah. That's it's that's actually crazy to think of how many people go. Yeah, like, how many people line up at the news agent, yeah. right? Just and shaking the hands, hoping. Yo, hoping please. at least get their money back. Look at the numbers, you know. Can, yeah. Please hope it's this week, <laughs> right? And people are out there praying and you know hoping and begging that they're going to win the lotto but they're not taking the actual steps it's like saying that everyone wants to lose weight but they want to take a man shake and they want to drink diet coke <laughs> and they don't want to walk around the lake or go and jog or go to the gym and yeah. that's something i need to do by the way <laughs> um but it's something that you know there's steps that you can take in your life to improve it and like you know that's another example. What are some other properties that you've been sort of... Well, it's funny because you mentioned like, oh, if you had a hundred grand, because we, we get properties under a hundred grand yeah, every now and then, but we had one, yeah. 102,000, just a single unit. I forget the rental. I think it was... They, they, they obviously all varied, but we had several of them, but they were on like the average of them was like three, 300. Some of them, I think, were like 260, some were 310. So around that mark. I can't even remember. I can't, I, can't, I can't remember. I don't even know which ones we're talking about. Like, there's so many. It's the ones we're... you were talking about in the emails before. When you'll sit on the couch. Oh, yes, so yes, like, yes, 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 um, yes, yes. So, yes. like, 260 to 310 rent. Yeah. Off a 102, 103, 103,000 dollar property. Yeah. And that one was just. And that one's even grown. If you look at that one five years ago, it was like five to six grand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. We did one today, which was a block of eight units uh for 500 grand and it brings in each unit is between Uh, 200 and 270 a week you get the whole block for um for 500 what was it like 40 50 passive like k Uh, i just conservatively said 30 grand passive so if someone bought it cash it'd get passive no that's if you had the loan on it right so if you had a loan at 80 percent on the property you'd still get 30k passive on that so that's you know that's a half a salary for someone to retire on, so you could just you know go oh well I'm just gonna you know make that happen and I got upset the other week because I was sold a property right just a random property of mine and I I've sold a couple just so people are aware because I don't normally sell, but I've I bought a block of units a hundred units in a block recently like there's some stuff I bought some big shit that I bought <laughs> I'll tell you about it later, but um I just need to free up some cash and um. I got some loans for the first time in a in a long time. Yeah, I got some that. loans, and um, I see the opportunity there. Like I don't care what the interest rate is, but I see the opportunity. And I remember sitting. I forget who it was. I, I told my mate, right? I told my mate. I think it was my mate Mitch. And I said to him, um, he told me he sold something, and I said, oh, I hope it's all sold thing, right? Because I wanted to free up some cash. And um, I sold this thing, and I made like a million bucks on it, right? Mm. And I was sitting there, I was like, I'm upset by it, right? And I'm like four times the price that I paid for it. And I was like, most people would be like, wow, I've just seen the yeah, 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 ecstatic. Yeah. I'm like, it's like, what could you know, it's, it's like a tragedy occurred, yeah. right? It's so like, fuck, I didn't want to sell it for that. Yeah. But, you know, it, it enabled me to go and buy a hundred more units. So it was one unit, I could swap it for a hundred. So good. It's also the mindset you have as well. Like yeah. Some people could even, you know, kind of like opportunity costs in your case how you're like yeah. well i could have kept on this for another five ten years whatever and it depends yeah. on me this but if you use that 
Now, obviously, sell it now, use that money to get those 100 units, which will do X for you in five years, 12 months, whatever. It'll make a million bucks passive. Well, there you yeah. go. See, so. Happy days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it works. Literally, I saw a million dollar property, a million dollar profit on the property. It was just a unit. It was literally just a unit. And the people come in, here's something, Charlie. Like, people might say to you, oh, I want a house and not a unit and stuff like that. We had a conversation yeah, about yeah, the yeah. other day, or well, today, actually. But that shitty unit made me a million bucks. Mm. Who cares what it is? I don't care what it is. Just give you the million bucks, right? It's, it's, a, it's a vehicle and the asset to get you. That's what, yeah. like, some clients don't even know what the property is. Obviously, they know what they look like, but yeah. they don't have that physical connection. They're not emotionally bonded to it. They don't yeah. go and drive by it every day and you know, yeah. fly to it or whatever. They just look at it. Yeah. You know, the person building is good and they look at the numbers and if it's the figures big... add up, then if it's a good tenant in there, then it's a good deal. Somewhere in the office, there's old marketing collateral. I made up these um, flyers, like, I had this girlfriend like maybe 15 years ago when I first started the business and she did some graphic design course. I mm. said, you make me some flyers? And they're around somewhere. She designed the first logo of the business. And um, it said in there, like, I, I remember these things. And I was like, what do I want people to know about my business? And it was like, numbers don't lie, right? Mm. You can lie to yourself. Your family can lie the to numbers you. Don't lie, the yeah. numbers don't lie. Follow the numbers. And that's, um, that's what's, you know, important is to... You know, follow the numbers. Like emotion gets you killed. If uh, if we go into if anyone goes into business and they go, oh well, I better employ this person. I, I my portfolio, and my property, fucking perfect, right? Nothing ever went wrong with it. Mm. But business life, like I've always applied business principles to my property portfolio. Yeah, of course. Never had any issues. But in business, back in the early days, I used to be like all emotion. Oh, this person's a good bloke, right? Or this person's a good chick, whatever. Yeah. And it's like, no, they're shit. If I have to say they're good, it's like I'm trying to justify why, they're, yeah, yeah, why yeah, they yeah. are, right? Um, so looking at it, like when you add emotion, when like in a business sense, a business fails. Most businesses that have failed have been based on some sort of emotional and not a logic decision. And that's why a lot of investors fail. But when you have logic and you base it on logic, that's... It's yeah. also the fact that having just, even in business or even your property portfolio, having like a long-term... You know, time frame horizon is like the biggest competitive advantage you could have in yeah. any business or your portfolio or just yeah, just in life really. Thinking, where will I be in not just ninety days like these people, twelve months, ten yeah. years, but like where will I be? I'm in playing. Years? I'm playing like five generations. Now. Exactly. Like, yeah, and then the... you have that generational wealth and all that yeah. stuff. It's yeah, you got to think long term horizon, especially with because a lot of people want that quick cash, quick money. You know, but mm. if you got to think long term, what is this going to do for me? Yeah. yeah. We appointed a, a new um, general manager, like our first general manager for the, the Birch Hotel Group today, or well, yesterday he started. And uh, I went out on the road and went out to the Mountains Hotel and walked through it and have a look at what the Renaults are and whatnot. And on the way back, like I said to him, notice at no point throughout the last three hours of our day or four hours that we've been hanging out, have I ever once said to you about the money aspect of it, right? I'm playing mm. the long game. I'm not looking at how I'm going to make a buck out of something. I'm looking at the bigger picture. I'm about building generational wealth. And, you know, it's when the, the, the mindset changes, it's it's an evolution. I didn't think that at the start. I was wanting to make a portfolio so I could earn 50 grand a year. Yeah. And I thought it was impossible to get there. Yeah. Right? And a lot of fuck a lot of, people, a lot of people do. Yeah. First of all, but yeah, I think it's... You just got three clients you rattled off the top of your yeah, head. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. <laughs> that have done yeah. in like two months, 60 yeah. days, 70 days. So, cool. Anyone got questions for Charlie? Let's go and have a look through the questions here. Um, what do we got here? Um, <laughs> what do we got here? Any thought? <laughs> here we go. Got asked from Kane. Any thoughts on the Skymo's comment to all his followers not trusting the UN? I think that's alleging to a point. It's an article that I don't have here, but um, allegedly last week they uncovered that the old prime minister of this country signed yeah, like himself as the whole jobs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that seems a bit dodgy, right? Yeah. <laughs> it seems a bit dodgy, right? It's, uh, yeah. Sam said it, inflation is transitory. Well, of course it's transitory if they try and throw us into a depression, but they're going to have to transitory themselves back out of there to hyperinflation. And that's the exciting part is the only cure for what they've just caused and created is turning those printers on so hard it'll cause hyperinflation. So I'm very excited. 
Uh, Chris just asked, would you still want to create a buffer or would you hold and weather the storm? Uh, Chris, good question. That would deem as more of a financial advice and I couldn't give you an answer because I don't know anything about your position. So um, on that, I'd probably suggest to, there's a link in the description of wherever you're watching this from on how to get uh, in contact and maybe book a chat with Charlie to get a bit more information so Charlie can work out sort of what your position looks like. If you have two properties and one creates a buffer, it wouldn't be the best thing. If you've got 100 properties, you know, your cash flow should be creating a buffer, yeah. uh, not your selling off an asset. But if you, it just depends on your position. Like we can't give you financial advice, but we can, you know, spitball a few ideas and have a chat with Charlie and, you know, weigh up the options and, yeah, go from there. That'd be more of a one-on-one -on -one sort of question. Um, uh, how do you buy cash but have no job, a drug dealer? Uh, Charlie said that, that this person's redesigned their life. So they so sold, his house. sold his house and then built the portfolio. The portfolio now brings in cash flow. And with that cash flow, this person is able to go and um, yeah purchase yeah. whatever they need to do and get loans and whatnot. So yeah, um, Tom, I did four in six months. Awesome work. I'll give you a high five. That's, 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 that's cool. Um, I don't I don't think we know Tom. But it's good. I don't know if that's the, the full true. name, but it, I, 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 it's not mine. No, no. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, hey, Birchie, sell up and retire. <laughs> I'll never retire. <laughs> uh, why would I want to sell my assets for manipulated digits on a screen? You know, why would you want to have money? You want cash flow. And if you sell your assets and you don't have cash flow, so it's not something I plan on doing. Uh, Harpreet said every single story make me feel go more aggressive seriously well that's you know I actually asked a mate of mine the other day I actually asked two mates I go to my close circle of friends and I tell them my problems right like I just I have problems every day right like Charlie is a few of them right people go oh Nathan must be having fucking oh let's walk beyond Nathan he must have shitted out another hundred dollar <laughs> note as he walks right I'm always trying to push myself so hard that I find myself in a position where I need to then push myself harder to push to the yep. next level. And um, like just tonight, like I was like, cool, we got some funding and I'm, I've never had loans for three or four or five years and uh, I'm going to get some loans. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go out on a shopping spree and I want to buy, I want to get to 100 motels in the next two years, right? So I've got like four motels on the run. And it's like, ask my mates, you know, is that, do I motivate you or do I fucking annoy you? And they're like, no, no, it makes me feel like I'm a lazy prick and I need to, you yeah. know, keep pushing. So it all depends on the people you surround yourself with. Surround yourself with, yeah. Um, these stories make me want to cry. That's not the intention of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, be interested in how you did it. Uh, I have investment property, two full time incomes, can't refinance, nothing. Um, it's important to get the right properties. Um, in the portfolio. I would love to get seven properties in 70 days. I'd be happy with seven in two years. That's good. Even yeah. that's good. Yeah, most, people, is... most people wouldn't even do that. They wouldn't get two in seven years. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Most people get one and stick with it for 30 years and then they downsize if anything. Yeah. Um, Brett said, I missed the start. Who's Charlie? Charlie. Um, I'm Charlie, not him. He's, he's Charlie. I'm Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> good, good to me. <laughs> um, so, Charlie, for those that are tuning in a little bit later um, today, um, what do you do here? How do you help people? Yeah. So I'm yeah. part of the investor relations team along with everyone else you've probably seen the last month or so. Um, yeah. My job is to liaise with clients and find out what their needs are and how we can get them to their goals, whether that be you know, passive income goals, X amount of properties, retire early, whatever it is, and mm -hmm. then kind of figure out what we need to do to get there. Uh -huh. If there's a time frame, there's no time frame. If they have certain aspects, and also educate them along the way. Yeah. So yeah. And that's um. Cool. And then we've got here. Um, Tom said he's going for number seven. That's awesome. That's, good. that's great. Um, uh, here we go. Sneak. Can you explain if we are taking debt in consideration, hyperinflation, or not, and why? Thanks, Birchie. Um, so with debt, um, debt becomes irrelevant with inflation. 
uh, how do we say this, right? I went to the shops the other day and Charlie wouldn't remember Paddle Pops at 80 cents, right? Because <laughs> I'm an old prick, right? But in 2008, uh, I used to smoke, Charlie. I didn't know if you know that. I, I didn't know that. Yeah, smoked two packs a day. And I'd go to the servo and pick up smokes, right? And I'd pack up a Paddle Pop every time, right? Mm. I like the rainbow paddle pop, but yeah. I'd mix it up a little <laughs> bit. But they used to be eighty cents, a dollar, dollar twenty, dollar sixty, dollar eighty, two dollars, two dollars forty. And what are at the petrol station, like four dollars? Yeah, they're like four bucks now yeah, for a paddle for pop. For the basic one, for a paddle pop, right? And what's, what's the nice brand? The um, Cornettos or the ma- that's a, yeah, the Cornetto because the drumsticks the shit one. The Magnums, they're the, the Magnums, nice they're, they're the expensive one. They're like yeah, dollars. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. It's crazy, right? <laughs> but when you look at it, like. You can't take a um, a perishable good into the future, right? No. But if you let's say that this pencil, right, was the paddle pop and it's eighty cents, right, and you had a loan on it for eighty cents, and now you go and sell it for four dollars, and you still got the loan at eighty cents, the debt of eighty cents might have seemed like a lot of money back in the day, but it's nothing now because you can pay it off. You can have, you know, you could buy four paddle pops. And got all five pedal pops. Your debt doesn't really inflate, and, you know, let your assets inflate while your debt basically Correct. stays the same. Correct. So the debt becomes if your money is losing or the currency that you're using, your dollars that you're using, whatever your currency is, um, if that is losing its purchasing power, that means that the, the value of the currency is deflating because in everything else is inflating, the currency is deflating. So if you're currency is deflating then your debt is becoming deflated as well so in my view and my personal thoughts on it is to take the debt through hyperinflation but there would be a point before our currency implodes and every currency that crashes gets to a point where it just hyperinflates too fast right mm-hmm. like a cheeseburger might become a hundred thousand dollars right mm. and it's at that point you go fuck like i could pay my house off with a cheeseburger <laughs> i may as well pay out the mortgage right because yeah. it resets and flicks over and they go well the currency's dead let's base our currency based on this dollar and every cent of debt that you had well then you get stuck and your current your debt bits revalued in that new, new currency, currency. Yeah. yeah so through that hyperinflation period is when i would be wanting to pay that off so mm. Um, wow, well, we've got some random questions in here. Question is with Gertie Pass. <laughs> wow, that's a funny one. Who is this? Guy? I don't know. I don't know. It's just uh, it's a funny question. I would I would share it. I would share it because um, the question was let's, let's say what the question is, right? And I don't. I've never touched drugs, but I I'd, I'd have to say I had a puff of a plant before and many years ago <laughs> puff of a plant i haven't smoked anything for years um what would birchie pass the blunt or would he keep it for himself right Is but if hog? you yeah if you get it for your hog you'd be just stoned and you look like an idiot yeah. but if you were passing it around you'd share it and everyone would be having a good time so sure. that's why we're passing the information on the passing the knowledge on we're having a good time <laughs> like that's why we do it <laughs> I kind of feel like I'm passing the knowledge blunt around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the be invested blunt. The be invested blunt. <laughs> cool. Um, so where is it here? Um, any other questions that we've got? Send them through um, for Charlie. Any other? Um... I had a question for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I was actually I was no dinosaurs were around when I was young. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> This is more for people who might be younger, um, like starting, or not not just younger, but people who may want, because I remember when I was younger, I really wanted to invest, yeah. and I was like, oh, well, you know, I was, you know, my, but my first job, I was a dishwasher, getting paid like $9.50, yeah, right. working in Castle Towers in the food court. I imagine getting paid $9.50 now. Yeah, I was, wouldn't buy your shit, wouldn't even get lettuce. Couldn't get anything. Wouldn't even get, <laughs> get a lettuce. Get two, <laughs> yeah, yeah, couldn't get lettuce, yeah. Um, I remember I always wanted to like save investment. So what would you say to like to someone if you just had a thousand dollars and you wanted like what would you do if you were to start again mm. just with a thousand dollars? Obviously you didn't have a business or any assets, just a thousand dollars. Because I know some people would say you work hard or you mm. educate yourself and you spend that thousand dollars on Education. acquiring skills and yeah. to boost your you know. Well it just depends. Like 
This is the truth be known. Like, I've never, like, I've never been that person who goes out and buys the courses and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Like, I've never been that sort of person. That's why I don't have, like, I don't just sell a new course every three months yeah, on yeah. a newsletter subscription or anything like that. Um, but I would just keep working on saving it and I'd have a plan. Like, so for me, how old were you when you had your job, the nine dollar fifty job? Like, it was like 14, 14, 14, yeah. 13, 14, I was very young. I worked, sometimes people give me shit in the comments. Like, I grew up in a family, we had a fish shop, like an aquarium, mm-hmm. like goldfish and tropical fish and shit like that. And I used to work in the shop, like selling stuff um, and whatnot. And um, I would go to school and I would have my diary, right? I wouldn't have like any shit in my diary about like whatever was meant to go in the diary. I would have in there, if I could fit in six hours worth of work, if I finished at lunchtime at school and fit in six hours, what that equates to dollar wise. And I actually had a goal of earning, I'd reverse engineer my plans. And I had a goal of getting to 10 properties from the age of 13. I had a goal of getting to 10 properties by the age of 30. I couldn't sign a contract before the age of 18. Yep. So I had 12 years of runway. Mm. And I thought if I could just buy one property a year for ten year, for twelve over 12 years, fuck up one or two years, something goes set. wrong, yeah. I'll be set. I thought it was impossible. Right? Mm. I thought it was absolutely impossible. I'd never heard of anyone doing it beforehand. And then when I got my first job, like I was working in the shop, but then I got my first real job. And I thought I wanted to be... I thought like real estate agents are rich and all this sort of stuff. And I worked in property management in Mount Druid, oh, in a real gosh. estate office. And I was putting up the sign, yeah. I was showing the open homes and all that sort of stuff. And I was like, this thing's fuck. Like I'm like out here, to, like, getting, like it's not exciting. Yeah. But my first job, I was like, okay, how much do I need to service to get a loan? So then I was like, I need to get a different job. And I just kept pushing myself and reverse engineered that plan. And I would do the same thing today. And I do the same principles today. It doesn't matter whether it's buying the 100 units that I was just talking about, yeah. doing something crazy, buying my new house that I bought recently. Um, you know, I just want to reverse engineer what the goals are. So if I was 17 again, and this is the thing, right? I actually did a video on this recently. And it was a question about if... If you had the option of trading places, Warren Buffett, right? He's the most go-to hail person, right? Warren They're Buffett. Yeah. What's he worth? Like a hundred billion dollars? Yeah. Let's say he's worth a hundred billion. Give or take dollars. a couple billion. <laughs> right? Give or take a couple of billions. Worth a hundred billion. Would you want to trade, Charlie, places with Warren Buffett and be worth a hundred billion dollars tomorrow? You have to change your whole life. You have to be Warren Buffett. Would I be, would I be as old as him? Yes. I don't know. You, you wouldn't be able to fucking you know, make love. You wouldn't. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to. You see the car he yeah. drives. You just. He, he's the most. He's one of them. Just going nerves, and he yeah, drives the ship. Yeah, he, he's in the car. I've been driving lately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you no know, one would want to trade places with Warren Buffett because he's about to cark it. So you can't put a price on the time that we have, right? So exactly. our time is valuable. That's talking as like an old bloke to you. The one thing but, I hate the most: people wasting my time. The yeah. one, one thing you can't get more of. You can't, don't deal with people wasting your time, right? And don't waste your time with stupid things in your life, right? Like, I wasted a good 10 years, 15 years of, like, stupidity. Like, you mm. know, whether it's going out and getting fucking drunk or whatever, like, you know, good memories, fun times, whatever. But they don't add any value. <laughs> in like, the grand scheme, yeah. Nothing's yeah. ever, nothing, what's ever come good from getting drunk at a pub? Right, Gosh, nothing, yeah. nothing, nothing ever good comes from it, right? Nothing ever good comes from certain things. And, you know, not that I ever got drunk too bad, but just, you know, I just look at it and go, the time is so valuable. So, if, you know, if you're young, just be wise with your time. Work out where you're directing your energy. Work out how you can get best return on your energy that you're selling. Yep. Understand you have to eat shit for a period of time. You don't, like, entitlement. There's so many young people that are entitled and they think, oh, I fucking should deserve this or I should have this. Or, you know, I see people come in, like, just drop interviews and it's like... Oh, I want a hundred grand a year as a manager. It's like, mate, <laughs> fucking, you wouldn't know how to manage yourself, let alone manage my team. Yeah. And it's like, uh, just do what you need to do, but have a plan, have a strategy, reverse engineer yeah. where it is. If you have to, if you've got a thousand bucks and you need twenty grand to get your first house, if you need thirty grand, well, you've got one thirty one thirtieth of what you need to get yep. to your first property. And once you get the first one, so just keep... It gets easier and easier. Yeah. The snowball kind of rolls and compound. If it took you 
five years to save a thousand dollars how can you get a thousand dollars saved in a month what can you do could you sell your car could you work harder could you get an extra shift should you could you clean more dishes could you mm. get a better job than nine dollars fifty right mm. like they're things that you need to do i've been there i didn't get like a fucking magical plane that came out of the sky and dropped, <laughs> dropped off money. And dropped money right um i feel like that happens every month with my rental income now and yeah. sort of things right it just comes through but that came as a sum of decisions and um uh, you know, um, thoughts and strategies that I had in my mind and actions that I took in order to get there. And I think if someone was young, keep your thousand bucks. Don't do anything with it. Like just keep that thousand bucks. I see all these things that go, oh, buy, buy crypto, buy Bitcoin. <laughs> you can get your thousand bucks into two grand or five and grand. It could be worth five hundred yeah. bucks. But just keep with the habits, the good habits of investing yourself. Strategy. Yeah. I um, saw. I heard some quote. This is this is going way back, but it was like. Yeah. It was someone asking like a similar question and they yeah. were like, oh, obviously like you put your money to a stock, let's say like yeah. something in the S&P 500, it goes up 50%, which is like yeah. phenomenal returns. Yeah. But you've got, you may have bought 500 bucks. Bucks, yeah. And they said like, don't invest in the S&P 500, invest in like the yeah. S&M 500. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, you know, the S&U, but like the S&M yeah. 500, invest in yourself to yeah. become more knowledgeable in whatever expertise, if that's property or a lot whatever of, it is. A lot of people that would be in a similar sort of, you know, position or profession that I'd be in mm. would say, you know, what I'd do is invest in my education, right? Yeah. I've got a course for nine hundred and ninety nine dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. right? It's like I guess so. there's a lot of people that would you know you scroll through Instagram through some motivational shit that'll just be there all the time. But you know, do invest in yourself, right? Investing in yourself, right? When I was seventeen, there was no Facebook Live, there was no Instagram, there was no um, YouTube, there was none of this stuff. And I had to go and just fucking sit there and draw down strategies mm. and stuff. And like, there's laptops here, right? You can see these laptops, right? Yeah. They're full of data, right? They're mm. full of like stuff that I just keep the laptops because it's got all my old little notes that I've made over the years. And if I look back at them, I'd laugh at myself. If I found the 18 year old version of myself, A, my 18 year old version of myself wouldn't believe where I am today, mm. right? And that's double my life beforehand, right? I'm 37 now, just for everyone to rub it in. But, <laughs> you know, I I would laugh at myself as an 18-year-old version, but as an 18-year-old version, I would think that it's impossible. Yeah, so, 100%. Just, yeah. Even, even regardless of, like, your specific point, you've gone just for, like, any Anyone. people. Any people. Yeah. You're getting into three properties in two right. years and all that. Like, you look back at that and you realise that, like we say to clients all the time, is you want to, you know, it's not, it's not sacrifice, but yeah, you know, maybe stay, maybe not, you know, buy a primary place and maybe stay renting for another eighteen months to get you two, three properties. So then, when you do want that primary place, it's more achievable or it's more nicer. You know, hold back those dreams so you can kind of work now to get a better dream or get there faster. I think a lot of people get stuck, right? They buy into the dream, right? Yeah. They buy into the dream. 100%. And the reason why the dream that people have to buy into is that you need to be asleep to live it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You need yeah. to be asleep yeah, to be living yeah. in it, right? That's true. Because the reality of it is, is that when, like, if people want to go buy their house to live in, I had the option to buy the house to live in and what I could afford. And I probably could have afforded a nice red brick house in Borkham Hills back in the day, right? It might have been 400, 500 grand, but interest rates were eight, nine percent. I was on 40 grand a year. Mm. It would have been really fucking struggle to get that one property, but that wouldn't have been my dream house. So for me, I looked at the asset. Like if people go out there and buy a principal place of residence and spend a million bucks on it, they're on the hook for that million bucks. Right? They've got to pay that, get out of bed if they feel it or not, whatever. You could buy five properties at 200 grand a piece, exactly. five sets of tenants. Re- paying those loans, yeah. five different income streams. So you've got your income plus five other rental incomes. And then if you push those rents up a little bit, you can adjust the numbers, make the tenants pay for your house. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's also similar with how like, um, like you're talking about how to, not like kind of the opportunities that you take and also the fact that, you know, do you buy that primary place and work harder your nine to five or you don't buy that primary place and buy several investment properties and kind of take your foot off the gas. Yeah, because it's more like a, it's more important what boat you row rather than, what boat you're in rather than how fast you row. Correct, and some people have to row really fucking fast. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. That, yeah, you got someone like the nine to five, like the nine dollar fifty me rowing really yeah. fast. Yeah, and it compares to like you know now we're in the future. Yeah, 
you're in a better boat, you don't have to row as fast, but you do like you you fly past the old you. I still love rowing really fast, right? <laughs> but you know, I'm rowing my fucking yacht instead of yeah, exactly, the boat, yeah, right? Exactly. And it's, you still keep up the speed because you, you know, a man's reach always exceeds his grasp. Yeah, I think that when you stop chasing that dream <clears throat> or stop chasing the goal, that's when you you know become miserable and mm. shit. Like no, I can not. picture myself like someone asked me today. Like, are you going to retire one day? I'm like, if I retire, I'll probably cuck it, right? Because mm. it's like, I just like doing what I do. I, I buy shit because I get bored. Yeah. I literally do <laughs> things get bored, yeah. right? No. Um, it's always saying how far you can push the envelope. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But not everyone's... business or anything. Uh, everybody's different, though. Some people are happy with what they want. And I think that's the cool thing about it is that the property's a vehicle, the whole system is a vehicle, like it's a vehicle, it's like what options you choose to take in order to get to that destination. And a lot of people don't have that destination in mind, they just have, you know, a thought or an idea yeah. of, yeah, of something. You can't do so. what 99% of people are doing if you want to be in the top 1%. Yeah. Any other questions, Charlie? No. Any other tips that you want to share? I know you're full of them, mate. Like you got tips? Of, mate, there's lots of I people. Know. I think there's lots of people here asking, Charlie. Like fucking, how do you, how do you get? How are you so wise? How do you, how are you so wise <laughs> by being so young? And how do you help people being so young? What's your about yeah, Nathan and Charlie, what's your thoughts on acquiring an asset in partnership during an acquisition phase? Have you use it um, in your journey? In partnership. Um, Marcelo, I think that's a discussion for offline for us to talk about your position but um be very careful when you're getting into a partnership with someone buying an asset i'll use an example me and charlie because i'm so old mm -hmm. right yeah and charlie's so young <laughs> i don't know it's running uh, yeah but like let's say for instance you've got two brothers right and Charlie's not my brother, but, you know, brother for another mother. Um, let's say you've got two brothers or two sisters or brother and sister, whatever. One might be 25 and one might be 30. The 30-year-old might be planning to have kids and the 25 might be planning to go on a Contiki tour. The 25-year-old wants to sell the property, the 30-year-old doesn't. It puts a... It, because it sounds great today, it may not be great in the future. Um, I've seen that personally, like my mum and my brothers own properties together and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, they're stuck and one might want to sell and the other one doesn't. And it just puts a bit of conflict in there. And, and um, yeah. if two people can afford, let's say, for instance, me and Charlie can afford a property each for 500000 right? A lot of people think, well, if we buy it together and go 50-50, we can buy a million dollar property, right? No. Let's say we go buy a property for 500000 they're going to take 500 grand of my income to service and they're going to take 500 grand of Charlie's income to service and then we can't buy any more than that. But if we bought a property, if I bought one for 500, you bought one for 500, then you could have, you know, we could have a million dollars collectively if you wanted to share that. Um, but then, you know, there is other people out there and this is why I said it's important for us to talk. You know, some people might be sitting there and go, okay, I might not have a job and Charlie has a job, right? Mm. I might have 200 grand and Charlie might have no no deposit, but he might have servicing for a million bucks. So together, collectively, I could say, okay, Charlie, here's, you know, 50 grand and you go buy the property. We go halves in it just with a handshake and a bit of an agreement, whatever. Mm. But that property goes under Charlie's name. So I have seen that sort of scenario happen beforehand. So very important to understand the parameters, know what you're getting yourself into. Um, no financial advice, of course, but do, you know, they're just different sort of scenarios of how I would look at it. So. It's also hard because sometimes there's people where like, if you want to pull equity, they'll... Yeah. Like what if I'm failing? If we're in it together and you want to pull equity out of the property, but if I, if you've doubled your income and I haven't, yeah, then I'm stopping you. I'm limiting you. I'm correct. I'm holding you back, really. So correct. I've seen two brothers do it pretty well. Like that have had, like one had cash and one had the servicing, and you know they were able to do cool things with it. So it can work, but <clears throat> be very mindful of to you know the pros and cons of that. Yeah. So, um, Gemma said that you've given me a 
complex and you won't be invited again. <laughs> oh, so yeah. enjoy Thanks, enjoy your you enjoy know, the limelight. Yeah, hour of fame here. Um, Christopher said, do you see an increased building cost will change the type of property typical Aussies will end up owning? And how would this impact most people investment choices? Good question. And it's a good question. And um, I actually have been looking at all of these large companies without going into uh, the names and all that. Um, but large companies, and you would probably know some people that you know would have knowledge about this stuff as well. Um, but some of these large development companies, <laughs> right, they have got a forecast that they're not building these large infill estates anymore. Yeah. They're sort of buying old sites and they're building, you know, 20 story unit blocks. And I think that as the cost rises too high, there used to be a time where everyone had a thousand square meter block and then it went to a 556 square block and then it's gone down to a 250 square block. So naturally people will be able to get less and less. So if you look at the poverty line, um, you know, of what we can have, you know, people's affordability has gone down due to inflation. And I think that um, as we look into the future, you know, yes, people have got a larger house, but if you had five acres in North Sydney, right, you could build whatever house you really want on there. You could yeah. chop off your driveway and sell it off there, right? <laughs> you could, yeah. But that's where people have sort of been pressured to. And I find it interesting that as we see booms go through, and this is where my fifth rule of investing came from, um, is look at where people can service to because the parameters have been manipulated so far that what's going to actually cause price rises. And if we look at like the Hills District where we are, you could buy a 300 square meter house, a land with a house with no ease on it mm. in, let's say, Kellyville for like one and a half, 1.8 mil. Or you could go down the road and get a, an older property on five acres for two and a half mil. Mm. Right? But why don't people just go for the two and a half mil one? I just don't get it, right? Because they can't afford it. Oh, right? yeah. They could fit 50 of those houses you on there, yeah. right? But the thing is, is that people all want that, but their surfacing doesn't allow it based on how the lending happens at the bank. And I think that that'll have a big impact on the future. And that's why I think it's important to have that fifth element to uh, your investing strategy. So, yeah. Naro, uh, do you think greenfield sites should always be considered unreasonable, not ideal investments, even if not good infrastructure, clear historical capital growth, i.e. one, three, five, ten years? Uh, look, naturally, everyone's going to be forced to, or wanting to go there. That's why they're going up. But I think there's a lot more value outside of the greenfield sites uh, to be had. I think that there's a lot of, you know, hype and speculation around the new sort of housing and stuff like that. Um, but I think that the real value is outside of those estates. So it's not something that, yeah. Um, <laughs> this guy. <laughs> oh, here we go. Coin that term, passing the bee, invest the knowledge blunt around. I love it. <laughs> um, what would su what would you suggest a guy that's gone through a divorce with 300 cash in the bank and makes 2080 a week, 38 years old? Then give... Get the click the link, have a chat with Charlie one on one. Like if I was in your position, That's good. like Charlie will get you the six properties in a month, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so on a serious note, I hope everything's all right with uh, what you've gone through. Um, but on another serious note, you know, I've seen people with three hundred grand cash get to, you know, I've seen people with 150 grand cash get to 10 properties in a year. So there's lots of variables that you've got there. Your income sounds good. I don't know if you've got kids or anything like that. So there's lots of variables. But I have seen people, you know, with 150 get to 10 in a year, you know, with 300. You'd be able to get, you know, if everything stacks up, all the lights, all the green lights to the city, should be able to get, you know, 10 very quickly. So, yeah. <laughs> Instagram for marketing continuing. It's good. Keep the ideas flowing, guys. Bit of creativity juice never hurt anyone, eh? <laughs> um, Can I get a comment on walking the line between serviceability and tax minimization? Yeah, good question, Brett. Um, walking the line on tax and servicing. No successful business 
out there survives on a tax deduction, right? So you wouldn't walk into, I don't know, Harvey Norman and see Jerry Harvey on the floor saying, no one sell anything today, we need to save some tax, right? He'd be like, if you didn't sell, he'd be like, get the fuck out, we're closing the shop, you all lost your job. So treating your investing like a business, you want to build wealth, but also minimize that tax. There's lots of strategies to minimize tax and it's not the typical ones, right? I have lots of creative ideas on how I, you know, look at tax. Um, I look at tax, you know, you have to pay your fair share of tax and what's right. I think Kerry Packer said it the best. You're probably too young. To, I've heard it where it's yeah. like, you're not spending it wisely, so I should pay you more. It's something like that, isn't well, it? Wow, yeah, I thought yeah. you were going to say, no, it's James Packer, not Kerry. His name's not Kerry, it's <laughs> no, Kerry. I've heard, I've heard, heard, yeah. heard of well, well, you've heard of Kerry Packer. There yeah. we go. <laughs> you've heard of the speech. But, um, yeah, so... <laughs> What's this here? I think he's applying to the um, the comment we said before. There we go. That's funny. I don't know what that is. It's very Virgie for fast to give up. <laughs> How did we get to here? Everyone's yeah. Don't get remarried. <laughs> hey, Charlie, like a... Looking sharp. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Adam. Uh, Virgie can just say thanks for that content. They thank you, Brendan, for the the fun. <laughs> uh, Four wheel walking frame will be at the office tomorrow for you at 38. You will need it now. You're old. Thank you. There we go. There we go, everyone. There we go. Um, uh, Andrew said, My dad once said his biggest regret in life was retiring, loved what he did too. And I think that, you know, if you do enjoy, like, life should all be about, like, we talked about um you know commodities before and right we talked about everyone thinks commodity is money but um i think the commodity is time and when you're investing mm. you're chaining your future time for you know money and that's what you want to try and limit is the, the time that you have to share and do more of the things that you like to do i know the shit i don't like to do do what do you see me doing the things i don't like to do sometimes i have to right but it's like i do what mm. i want to do yeah, like, yeah. live so, life on your terms <laughs> live life on your terms and i think everyone should do that so if you're living the life that you want and you're happy with your life keep living it and if you're not then something needs to change to to get you closer to that point um uh jonathan said what is the best overall debt to ownership ratio i think zero debt would be the best position <laughs> all right it gets there um my properties are just paying themselves off so i look at my portfolio today and um the portfolio, when I first started, I was, I was buying properties at 95% LVR. I had no idea what was going on. I bought the first one with the 80% LVR, then I went to 90%, 95% LVR, and I was like, wow, 95% LVR, I've got to have money like works. Ones, no, no, no money down. And, <laughs> That's yeah. what you were going to do next. Well, then I hit a wall, because I was like 95% LVR, and then I couldn't. I didn't know about pulling out equity, I didn't know this. So your guys that you're talking about tonight, Charlie, that have got like, seven properties in 70 days and stuff like that. Like, it took me like two years to get there, right? And all of them are, yeah. all the guy did seven. No, they were all 20% deposits. 20% deposits. And then when we get to the next seven, he's gonna have to, you know, he's gonna be able to pull out that equity because he structured yeah. his loans, right? Um, so if I look at the properties that I bought with the 95% OVR, I actually have some of them still on, you know, it's actually funny, right? Because I remember Rose didn't. It took her like ages to get me a loan. It was forty seven thousand five hundred as a took loan. Took long to get the loan. Forty seven thousand five hundred for the loan, and it was a fifty thousand purchase, right? So it was <laughs> nothing down. I was, I was mad. Fifty grand. I look at the properties now, and the loans are nothing. Like I might owe like fifty price. grand, twenty grand, shit like that, and the loans have been paying themselves down over the years, um, and the properties were nothing value. Mm. So yeah, it's. At the start, it's okay to be more aggressive, but at the later parts, it's you know you don't want to. So, um, cool. We've got lots of messages coming through. Um, why use a twenty percent deposit? Wouldn't it be more logical to use the least amount of deposit? <laughs> I didn't even see that question yeah. when I said that. But um, in short, twenty percent is easy to pull out the equity. It's better to pull out equity. But if you want to put a smaller deposit, you can. But it means it's harder to pull out the equity. So, um, yeah. Um, swap positions with us nine to five tax slaves. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's on fire. Mm. Um, 
cool. Uh, interesting. Do you think the developers are then feeding off that hype speculation to continue churning away? Yes, 100%. Um, do you think if someone's universal basic income is the bank income, the bank is still going to lend money to some to buy real estate? Um, yeah, I think they're going to build more Ponzi schemes on top of this to keep this bubble alive. Um, the... Um, someone just wrote here after that universally owned government properties on a 99 year lease it could be a point mm -hmm. and a lot of new developers are actually talking about leaseholds properties where you don't own the land you just own the building on Isn't top they do in the UK I remember Gemma talking about that well, maybe yeah. not her but it was like you never yeah. actually own the property you just have Correct. a you have no, a lease over it have a rolling yeah. lease over it so um, in Canberra I believe um, I've never bought in Canberra it just seems like a miserable commie place <laughs> like everything looks like Russia or something, you know? like it's like it's, it's like a compound in China, but and no offense to any of my friends down in Canberra, but everyone should know what I'm talking about here. I've just never gone to buy there, right? Um, and I believe from what I've been told is that there's 99 year leases in there. The land is owned by the the the, the territory, yeah. So yeah, um, Joel said, "What are your thoughts on the new land tax um, policy in Queensland?" Um, like anything, uh, you know, I'm not overly concerned. Um, I've done some numbers and yes, I would be affected in a negative way if that was to occur. Uh, a lot of that stuff I think is self-admission. You know, if you want to try and steal my money, you've got to try and come with a fucking good enough weapon to get mm -hmm. that. Um, so good luck to them. You know, self-admission is not something I'm not going to call them. Oh, how about you text me some more, right? They're going to try and get it. They can try and get it. But secondly... This will cause a bigger issue to their state, which will mean that rents will rise and will cause a lot more pressure. So um, I'm not too concerned at this point, um, but I'll wait and see and uh, you know, reassess when it happens. But uh, if it occurs in Queensland, it could happen in any other state as well. And if it successfully worked in Queensland, it would successfully roll out anywhere else. And if they're taxing you at an extra 2.5%, I'd just be passing that on to the tenant. So, yeah. That's what you do with anything anyway. And yeah. interest rate increase to pass on to the tenant, and when the interest rate falls, cash flows. Your rent stays the same. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing as well is that um, one thing that I've always talked about is I'm a big fan of, I don't care about the land content. Like, I've got all these people that go, I oh, must buy a house, must right? Buy land, must buy, must buy a house, must buy a house. Imagine you had $10 million worth of land in Sydney. And then you go buy one little shitty unit in Queensland and then suddenly you have to pay all this land tax based on this <laughs> stuff, right? So all the people that want to go and go, well, it's the land that goes up. It's not the land that goes up in value. It's the asset, right? You've got the build costs that's going to fit yeah. in and all that. And I want to play in the everyday person. I want to play where everyone can afford to be playing in my field. So I don't want to be buying and locking out, you know, three quarters or, you know, 90% of the population. So, yeah, looking at it... Um, a lot of people will focus just purely on land value. They're like, I oh, must have a lot of land. It's like, well, if you cash flow shit now, you're really going to get wiped out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the stuff that we buy is a balance of, of all that. All depends on what you do with the land. Like, even, even if you don't build, like yeah. places out, not necessarily anywhere you live, but like further. Yeah. How much that would have gone for 10 years ago compared to now? Yeah. So then we've got here, there's lots of questions about Charlie. That's his story. I'm sure he'll talk about that on another day. But 20% um, deposit. Okay, so when we're pulling out um, equity for... Okay, How, the question is, is what... That's another question. Let's keep going out. Never stops. <laughs> um uh, can you expand on the 20% deposit? Is it easy to pull out equity and why? Isn't equity the same for 20% deposit as is for 10% deposit? That's a good question and I'll run through it. It's very easy to explain. Let's assume that I want to go to the bank and it's just an everyday person. Like if I go to the bank, like it's like a red alarm goes off. Like, fuck, this guy's coming. <laughs> he's, in like, yeah, he's in the building. <laughs> Watch out for it, right? But um, let's say, for instance, someone goes to the bank and they apply for a loan, right? And they go, I want to buy a property for 200 grand. I've got 50 grand in the bank, right? The bank goes, okay, cool. If we give you an 80% loan, that'll be 160K loan, 40K deposit, 10K for closing cost. Mm -hmm. uh, the bank can then go at the back. You do your application. Yep, they tick it all off. Your loan's approved, right? 
when you then go to a 90% lend, what happens is that we then invite to the table the lender's mortgage insurance company where you have to pay the lender's mortgage insurance. When you pay the lender's mortgage insurance, people go, oh, well, it's there to protect me. No, it's to protect the bank in case you default on your mortgage. So you put down the 20 grand deposit instead of the 40 grand deposit, and you've got the deal with the bank. But then you've also got the lender's mortgage insurance, which then starts putting new stipulations on. The mortgage insurance company now comes in and says, well, uh, we must have a full valuation. Um, we must have properties in this location. If we feel that you've got, if they've got too much risk in a certain block or whatever the case might be, then they will, you know, not want to lend or be as, have such a great appetite. Mm. The problem is, is that if you go directly to the bank and get the loan, you, you're dealing with the bank themselves. You're not dealing with a third party. You're bringing a third person in to then add extra rules and terms and conditions. Now, when the insurance mortgage insurance company adds the terms and conditions, they're saying they want full valuation and stuff like that. Now, when you order a full valuation at the bank, it then triggers off to say that that has to sit on your file nine times out of ten, depending on the bank and the policies they are, I believe they're all the same or very similar, that that valuation sits on file for 12 months. If you were a contract to sale, if you were a desktop valuation, if you were a, a curbside valuation, then that doesn't sit on there the same. But when you have a full valuation that sits on file, meaning that you can't go back to the bank within two weeks or three months and then go and revalue it because then the value will come out and say, well, the property's worth what it was three months ago and it's the opinion of the valuer against you. Uh, if you want to then take your property and say, well, I don't like you, whatever bank, and go to another bank, well, then you take it to another bank and they, they might say, oh, well, you've got 50K equity in it. It's like, great, I'm going to bring the loan up. And then they go, no, 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 we're going to value at 80%, right? And so then you've lost your mortgage insurance that you've paid. And when you go to 80%, well, then you've lost all the equity that you would have got. Mm. And then if you go to the full valuation, well, then they, if you go to the mortgage insurance again, then they're going to ask you to do full valuation. If they do the full valuation, well, then that sits on file and you're still going to pay the new mortgage insurance on top of the old mortgage insurance. So you're paying double in the mortgage insurance space. So that's just in short, you know, very shorthand uh, view on the take of it. So um, does Zinger do low doc? We do all different types of loans. There's products out there, like there's literally about three, 400 different lenders out there um, that you can get, um, you know, loans from. There's banks that will do no doc, right? There's banks that will, you know, lend you just purely on the asset. Um, there's many different, um, you know, pros and cons. Uh, what websites do you... Um, scroll. Uh, I'm trying to scroll up. It's not working. Um, what websites do you look at for property research? What are your thoughts on Airbnb or do you prefer full-time tenants? Uh, I have no Airbnb properties. Um, I actually own about a 1,000 keys to a thousand motel rooms though um, but I don't buy properties for Airbnb um, the reason being there's two two different reasons I drop a pencil I play with um, um, so a few different reasons one the insurance issue two um, the uh, risk element that comes to it three um, when you're going to get the bank the bank doesn't take that as an income so you might have 50 grand a year income coming from rent. If it was full term, you might get 80 grand if it's Airbnb and you're like, great, I'm 30 grand better off, but the bank doesn't see that as a permanent rental, so they don't take it on board for servicing. So very, very important to you know keep the banks happy. If you can't keep the banks happy, they're not going to give you loans. You can't get the loans, you can't get the portfolio. So on that note, right, we're only for an hour and a half and uh, I think everyone's liked seeing you today, Charlie, and they like the story, so... Um, on that, yeah, on that note, I think we should head off shortly and um, yeah, lots of different comments coming through. If you would like to um, get in contact with Charlie, you can call the office on 1300 367 925, email us at admin at beinvested.com.au. The easiest way is to, wherever the description is from the device that you're watching from, click the link. There's a click and click the link. Um, book a chat with Charlie in uh, your calendar and uh, have a conversation to see if Charlie can talk about you next time he's online. If I allow him because he keeps <laughs> being ageist to me. Ageist. <laughs> ageist. Isn't it? Yeah, it's not like, you know, it's, uh, yeah, but no, you'll be back. You'll be back, Charlie. It's all it was good, great. So. It, was, it was good being on here. 
keep up it. keep up the good work um keep helping the investors do what you do with them um seven properties in 70 days i'm sure there's people watching this going oh you know that sounds like a good story but it sounds too good to be true it's a wazzy it's a woozy <laughs> it's a wazzy it's a woozy it's a goozy um four properties cash like these are they're cool stories you know they, that's you know what we've been doing for do, yeah. for for decades now so yeah cool well we'll catch up soon guys thanks a lot for tuning in spending your tuesday night with us and keep being awesome bye for now see you guys thanks charlie <laughs>